Hi, I'm Charlene Jurgensen and welcome to Inspired by Char. Today I'm going to show you how to make the pineapple log cabin. This is one of my favorite variations of the log cabin because it represents friendship or hospitality in your home. I'm going to show you some variations of the pattern and then I'll take you through the cutting as well as the sewing of these blocks. The first quilt that I'm going to show you is my Christmas variation of the pineapple log cabin. When you look at it, you'll see that there are two reds and two greens throughout the whole quilt. The same block makes the whole quilt, it's just that the blocks are turned 90 degrees to create the design. The folded squares give it that three-dimensional look when it's completely finished. The quilting on this one, when you look at it closely, you'll see that there's a free motion quilting in the background of each of these areas. For example, this green area or the red area, all of them have a free, mo free motion design in them. This one would look really nice as a table topper or a wall quilt for the holidays. The next one that I'm showing you is done from scraps of batiks and I know that most of you do have scraps in your stash and this is a wonderful project to use them up in. When you look closely at it you'll see that I've kind of chosen all of the same colors throughout the same quilt. Uh, I haven't strayed off from these colors like it's there's a lot of blues greens, purples, and pinks. And that's kind of the palette that I stayed with. So when you create a scrap quilt, you decide what you want your range of color to be. Lay up all your scraps and then decide how, how you want, which ones you want to use in the quilt. Again, this is a three-dimensional quilt and the folded squares, are the black path that goes through them, are the folded squares and I'll show you a really nice way to put those on. A great beginner project. Now this same project can be done in the miniature size and when you look over at this wall you'll see that there are two variations of it in the miniature size. The first one that you're looking at has the folded squares of the cream background and then the logs behind it are my scraps uh, left over from other sewing projects. This one is quilted in the ditch around each of the blocks and that is the the way this one is quilted. It's These blocks are a little bit too small to do anything else with them. So that is the first one and when you look at the the one next to it you'll see it's the same pattern but instead of the cream in here we have put the color for the path and the cream are the logs in the background. So another nice way to use up small, even smaller scraps in the pineapple log cabin. A lot of fun to do. You can even do Christmas ornaments with this pattern. And if you look here in front of me, you'll see that I have a little, it could be a coaster or a tree ornament. Um, and I turn it over and you'll see that the same pattern is on both sides. Because of the templates being uh, transparent, I was able to fussy cut Santa Claus to go in the center of the block and then travel around with the other fabrics. The other one is just a simple uh, block uh, turned into a nice, a nice table topper or something that you might want to use probably 
it's a little too big for a pot holder, so if I didn't put all of the rounds on it, I would have a nice um, pot holder. So it's just a fun, fun project to experiment with. The tools that I get to use today are really fun to work with. And what I have off to my right here are the template sets that I work with. And they come in two sizes. You can buy them either in the miniature size or the large size. They both come with instructions to build the patterns. The large book um, comes, of course, with the large size. And the miniature one would come with the miniature template set. All of the templates have the seam allowance included in them. And by the way, they are laser cut and computer drafted, so they're very, very accurate. As you look at these, you'll see that all of the templates have fabric grips on the back side of them. And these come in a package. They're little felt circles, and I put them on the, on the corners of each of the shapes to keep them from slipping when I do my cutting. Also, all of the templates, they have letters from A, they go all the way up to J. So you have all of those uh, labeled so you don't get them confused when you're working. And when you're building the project in the book, everything tells you to bring, pick up A or B or whatever. So you keep track of them in that way. So now let's get started cutting. I have a stash of scraps off here to my right, or my left, I guess, your right. And this is probably what your stash is going to look like. You'll have little pieces of fabric of all sizes and shapes. At least that's what my stash looks like. Then what you can do is take a couple of those pieces and you can stack as many as six on top of each other. We'll see what size here we have. Oh, I think I can get the most out of this one. I'll pick one of the templates and see what size I can get out of there. You know, I probably get a little smaller one. So we'll cut like this. And I like to work on a rotating mat. That way I can get around those shapes. And I also like to work with a small rotary cutter. So there we have a couple of logs the same size. And what I do is cut up all of my log shapes until I have many of each of the sizes that I need. We'll take, we'll actually take that same cut. We'll follow that cut edge. We'll follow around so we don't waste that little bit of our scrap. Now I'll take this off. We can throw this one. Oh no, we can't throw it. We've still got some left there. You can still get another piece there. But now we'll have to switch down to a smaller piece. See how we can keep on going with our scraps of fabric. So now we'll take a smaller one. I won't be able to get two out of it. But if you stack six layers on top of each other, you won't believe how fast you'll get a lot of logs cut. You don't want to take your ruler and measure for every single one of them. So there you've already got two different sizes. And continue on through your uh, scrap stash. Now let's take this one. This is a nice long one. We can get a longer one here, right out of the center. Scoot it down a little bit. Now we have another size. See how fast that goes? And I bet you if I open this up, I will find another piece inside of here. So how fun is that? Just using up your stuff. Here I found a strip like this, just happens to be a long narrow one. I could possibly take one of the longer templates, 
place it up on there and I'd get some pieces out of there. And I won't take time to do that. Well, you know what? I think I will because I think it'd be fun to show you how I could get a whole bunch of them at the same time. See what we can do here. We have one, two, three. I think there's five of them here. We'll arrange them real nice. We've got quite a mess of stuff over there. Let's see, how long can we go? Sure, we can go right there. We'll cut it off. We don't want to disturb our cutting there, though. Get rid of the tails. Those grips keep uh, connection with the fabric underneath, which makes it very nice. Now we have that size cut. So that's how you would cut a whole bunch. Jeepers, I have one, two, actually I have six of those at one time. So we already have all of those different sizes. I'm not going to cut every log, but now I want to show you how you could cut probably from strips of fabric. Let's take this one. I like this one. We'll take this off of here. Now that we're cutting from bigger chunks of fabric, let's see what we have here. We'll straighten up the edge. We don't even want to waste our scraps. Let's see. Oh, I have two layers. Okay. You gotta see where this edge is. We'll straighten up one of those edges like this. This is the way I actually prefer to do my cutting. After you've made the first cut in straightening, I'm going to turn the board without disturbing the fabric. Now I'll pick a shape. I don't think we've cut one that size. We'll move, whoops, I gotta go to this side, see how far it is. I need a five and a half inch strip. I think that's about right, right there. Okay, we'll cut that strip. And I'm going to remove that. But you know what? I'm not going to disturb this just yet. I'm going to cut a 1 and 3 fourths inch strip from that one. And I'm kind of mass producing here, and I'll show you why. I did this in a little bit. I didn't want to disturb that fabric as long as I had it straightened. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take both of those strips. I'm going to move this out of the way here. Slide this over here. You need lots of room to do this. Okay, now I'm going to bifold this piece up on top of here as well as this piece. Multitasking. Okay. Now, was that the one I did? Nope. It's this one. This is the D template. Okay. We'll cut that one first. The reason I prefer cutting the strips this way is so that when I get to the edge of this strip, I will actually keep cutting now all the way through, and when I get to the end, I possibly will only have that much waste at the end. When you cut your strip this way, you have the option, you will possibly waste a little fabric, but let me show you another way that we can do this. Now I'm going to take advantage of every little piece of fabric, and I'm going to switch out two different logs. So, whoops. 
What did I do that for? I disturbed it. Okay. Now we'll take another log. We'll go to another size. We'll take this one. You want to have the same fabric, but in a different size log. Okay, now we have that size. And you'll just keep moving along. This way, this color of fabric will be moving throughout the quilt, but in a different place in the log cabin. We probably should have, and then we'll end up with this one right here. So I only have this little bit of waist there. So you see how you can get multiple sizes from the same strip of fabric. Let's see how many sizes we have. We have one, two, is this one of them? That's the same one. So you can get many different sizes by going from that same strip. And when you get closer to the end, go down to the smaller piece. On this one, I would just stay with the same piece working all the way through until you get completely cut. I won't do any more of the cutting of those because uh, the cutting is actually the same no matter which piece of fabric you pick up. You just pick, pick a different size template. But we've got an awful lot of pieces cut. Then when I get all done with the cutting, I will take my stacks of pieces by size over to the sewing machine and here I've got them kind of, oh, we got a size in here that I missed. There are many sizes in the block, and you have enough to go all the way around. You keep making paths going around. And so I cut probably for an hour or so, and then I'll go sew. And then when I used up those pieces, I'll go back and cut some more of my scraps. It's a lot of fun to see what you can get out of your scraps. Now that we have done the cutting, I think it's going to be fun to show you how to sew the pieces together. Now is the fun part. I get to sew all the pieces together that we cut at the cutting table. When you look off to my side here, you'll see I have stacks of each of the logs that we cut in all kinds of different colors. So as I'm sewing the blocks, I will be picking pieces from that stack depending on where I am in that particular block. I also have some uh, black squares that start out the center. And let's see, what else do I need? Oh, I need a beautiful new sewing machine. It is the Quattro by Brother. I am so fortunate that I get to sew on such a beautiful machine because it's loaded with all of the latest features that are available to the sewers today. The first thing I want you to do is set your sewing machine for the right seam allowance. And I'm going to sew a center square to, onto the first uh, piece that goes into the block. So I'll pick, pick up the center square Oh, well, that's a nice bright one. I think I'd like to start with one of those. So we'll put those two together. It's so relaxing. Now the cutting is all done and here's the fun part. Match up the corners on both ends. Everything matches perfectly. When I sew the patchwork, I like to start sewing on an anchor cloth. That way when I come on to the uh, patchwork that I actually am working on, those stitches will be just as strong. So the first one will help me decide if I have the right seam allowance. Now we'll go back onto an anchor cloth. Clip the thread. And before I take the sewing test, I will finger press this seam open. First on the wrong side. And then on the right side. Always finger press on a hard surface and it, you'll get a much better job. Now to see that I have passed that sewing test, 
I'm going to place template C on top and see if it's the same length. And it is. So now I can continue on with confidence. So I will go to the next stack of logs and we'll see what color I want to pick. Maybe I think a purple one or a magenta one would look kind of nice next to it. So we'll put that one on. Now here I have one already started and you always want to go in the same direction all the time around the block. So we'll continue to go in the same direction. That happens to match perfectly. This is a great, great pot project for beginners. And the advanced quilters like to play with the log cabin because you can experiment so much with color and design. So really all skill levels like to work with this pattern. Then we'll finger press this one open and we'll keep adding logs until we've gone completely around that block. Now we still need to add one more from that pile and I think we need, this is um, log C, nice color in there. And we'll continue along. See how we have a perfect match? Always guide your fabric with the stiletto as you sew your seams. again onto an anchor cloth. Now if I were making a large quilt, I would chain sew as I go. So I would continue from one block to the other and it would go a lot faster. Take the time to finger press that seam open. Remember I said the quarter inch was included in all of the templates? Now we'll go to template D or log D, and we'll see what we have for color in that pile. I thought I had something with some gold in the pile here. I think it's time to add something with more color. Well, maybe we'll have to go with this one right here. So maybe t the next time I do some cutting, I'll get some gold into the block. There you go, it's a perfect match, and we'll put this one on. And this is the last log that we have to add to completely go around that first round. Each time I add a log, I'm adding one and a fourth inch in finished width to the block. Now you can go around this block or this center as many times as you want to. Um, just depends on how, how big you want the finished size. But just remember that each time you add one, you're adding one and a fourth inch to the width of your block. That is in finished size, I mean. Okay, now we'll press that one open and we'll see what we have. The center starts out with a larger square than your traditional log cabin block does. Now I'll take it to the iron and we'll press real nicely with steam so that it lays nice and flat. Whoops mess that one up a little bit. I love to use steam. It gives you a nice, uh, nice press. That's the first part of the block. The next part, you're going to add folded squares in the corner. 
The folded squares are the same size as the center square in your block. What it is is one of those folded in half. So it's the same size as the center square. What you do is you take that square over to the ironing board, fold it in half, and give it a nice press. And that's the part that gives you your three-dimensional uh, log cabin design. Now you take those folded squares and place them down on the block that you're going around. And this is the part where I do something a little bit different. I take a glue stick to hold that shape or that folded square in place. Lift up the corner and just put a tiny touch of glue there. And then we'll go to the other corner and put a touch of glue right there. That'll hold it in place while I'm sewing the seam. Take one more of the folded squares and place it over here. But you know there's something that I forgot to say about this part. When you look closer at the block that I made uh, for the center of the block, you'll see that there's one part of the block that has two seams going across. That's the first edge where you put the folded squares. Always add them to the side that has the two seams um, in that side of the block. See these have just one seam um, from that part on. So just remember that you want to do it that way. Okay. Now we've got the glue, but I got to make sure that I've got this matched in the corner here. I'll hold that with one finger and we'll put that in place there. The only reason I'm doing the glue stick is to hold it in place as I'm working my way around the block. Okay, that'll hold it in place. And it's a good idea to put the cover on the glue so it doesn't dry out. Now we need to add the next log on that side. Let's see what we want to do for color here. Oh, I think a pink one would be good. We'll add this one right here. See, that happens to be the same size. This is log D. Uh, something else I want to point out right here. If you look right here in the corner, you see how the edge of the folded square matches perfectly to that, as well as down here. You want to look for that. Okay, now we place this up on top. and we're ready to sew that seam. Holding in place with the stiletto. I just realized I'm doing this without any pins. You know, when you use the stiletto, it really is, um, instead of pins, a lot of the time, so it saves you time. So now back onto your anchor cloth. Remember, no back stitching at the beginning or end of the seam. That'll just create bulk in your seam line. Now, at the beginning of this uh, block, all of the seams were pressed open. Now we're going to press the rest of the seams going out. Wow, I got a perfect match there. I'll show you when I, I'll finger press it first and then I'll press it with the iron. Give it a little bit of steam so it holds it down real nice. And then I get to show you the finished project or product. See how what a perfect point we have there? It's matched here just like it was here. Now remember I said that every time you add a log, you want to add it on the side that has the two seams. Well, if you can't remember, just look at the back side of your block, and now this is the two seams right here. So we'll, we'll know that we have to add the next one on this side. 
So let's go to this pile and see what we have for color here. Oh, I found a gold one with a little bit of gold in it. So there we could use that one. And if you don't like any of the others better, I think we'll stick with that one. And we'll put, we'll be putting that one on next. But you know what I need to do? I need to add another folded square. So we'll lay that one down on the corner. Match the corner up here. Put a little glue on the other two ends. And because I passed that sewing test in the beginning, do you realize that everything has matched from that point on? I need to stick this down. And hold it in place. And now we can put this one right like that and continue on around the block. Always guiding with the stiletto. Perfect. I have again another great point right in here. Now let's look up at the design wall. If you look over here at this block, you'll see that I've come a little bit farther. You just continue working your way around that block until you have the finished block. The finished block up here has everything done except I need to add that very last triangle on the outside edge. To do that, I'm going to hold, um, again, putting them down with a glue stick to hold them in place. We'll just kind of stick them in the corner here. But this time I want to sew with a different seam allowance because I don't want the stitching to show um, in the seam line when we go to the next part. So I'll lift my presser foot and I'll lift my needle. Now I want to change the seam allowance because I don't want the stitching on the outside edge of the block to add that last uh, triangle on to show when I connect the blocks together because I don't want to do any ripping. So I'm going to move the needle farther to the right. So I will touch this plus on the stitch as far as it will go. And then I will do a mirror image to bring it all the way to the right. And that's where I want to sew. I want to hide this stitching inside um, that last seam that I make. Okay, get my stiletto in place. This is just basically to hold this triangle uh, when I'm connecting the rows together. Go to the other corner and we'll work our way completely around the block. But I better put the glue stick on because I don't want that little girl to move. 
We've got everything so perfectly matched to this point. We just don't want anything to move. I feel so strange when I don't have that stiletto in my hand. It really is a big help. Okay. Continue our way around. Now that you've sewn completely around the whole block, attaching the folded squares on each of the corner, we're going to start sewing the blocks together. So we'll use the scissor and cut our thread. And now we'll lift this out and we'll connect the next block. One thing that I forgot to tell you uh, when I was sticking those little folded squares on was that it was not just any old glue stick. I used a fabric glue to put them together. After you have sewn all of your blocks together, then you can twist and turn that block to see how you want to put them together. Do you want to put probably those together, this together? I like the contrast right in here, although that's awfully close to that orange, so we'll keep turning it until we find... I kind of like that one. Nope, these are close together. So let's go like this one. There we go. Okay, now I'm going to put those right sides together and we'll pin this seam and I'll show you how I get that match. When I do this, I'm going to now fold this corner back so that the two folded squares are actually touching each other. This time I'm going to sneak a pin in here and then I'll go down into here and I'll put that pin in at an angle like that. So now I have matched that corner and I'll fold it back one more time and see if I have it. Yep, there it is. Okay, now we'll do the same with this one. We'll fold this one back, sneak it in like that, do like that. And another way you can do it is run the pin along that crease you'll be able to feel that with the pin. Now remember that we moved the seam allowance to attach that outer edge, so we have to move it back to the correct seam allowance for sewing this seam. So we will go back to our scant quarter inch seam allowance that we had in the beginning. a mirror image. And now we have the perfect seam allowance. Remember all of your patchwork must be sewn with a scant quarter inch seam allowance. And that will make up for the fabric that's used in your seam line. Start sewing on an anchor cloth. Okay, match these corners up. Guide it under the presser foot with the stiletto. Continue sewing. Always remember to sew slow over the pins. We'll go to the other end. Always make sure that everything is matched up on the end. And then before you get off the end, get your anchor cloth ready to sew off. And you are done with that seam. Now we get to look and see what we have there. When I do use pins, I like to use the silk pins because um, they're easier to sew over if you find it necessary to do so. Okay, here we get to look. Perfect. That one's perfect, and that one's perfect. 
So remember to use that little trick when you do your pinning. The last seam that you have, you will press this one open just like all the other ones. And I won't take the time to do that, but just remember that all of the seams, you start out in the center of block, those are pressed open, and then the next two rounds, the seams are pressed to one side, and when you turn it over, it's probably easier to see that part. These are pressed open, and then the next two rows are pressed going out. Because on these, you have a little bit more bulk to deal with because of those folded squares. And then the last seam, there's quite a bit of bulk, so those you want to press open. Now remember that the size of your quilt is determined by the number of blocks that you do in a row and then the number of rows that you sew together. So have fun uh, using up your scraps and determining your own size. You could possibly make this into a table runner. Now the one that's in front of me is like a Christmas table runner of the first one that I showed you on the wall. This one's quilted, however, a little bit different than the first one I showed you. And these are quilted a fourth of an inch from each of the edge. And so here we've gone like this, and then around each color combination, a fourth of an inch of, on each edge. Then in this part here, we have just gone on the outside edge of that color. So it just looks a little bit different when it's finished. And then on the center of it, we've stitched a quarter of an inch in from the center. Now again, this could be lengthened just by adding more blocks. The next thing I'm going to show you is how to put on the binding when you get all of the blocks sewn. Now that we have the quilt quilted. And before I put the binding on, I want to talk a little bit about how Linda quilted this one. It's really unique and very fun to look at. What she's done is she started out with the star in the center of each of the blocks, and then she's done a circle around here so you have a different appearance of the folded squares. So all around each one of these, you'll see that there's a circle. And then out in this one here, Again, a little circle on the corner uh, patchwork right in here. When I put my binding on, I like to cut two inch strips of fabric, fold them in half, and then I put a nice crease in the uh, binding, and so it's now ready to put on. Right sides together. I had started putting it on because I wanted to get to the end of the binding and show you actually how to uh, end off. So I have done actually two and a half sides of it. What I'm going to do now is um, follow along the edge. I've got the binding matching the edge of the quilt and as we approach the corner I get to show you how to turn a perfect corner. You know what, it's so much easier to put binding on when you have a nice big table uh, like I have to work on. This happens to be one of the Tracy tables, which has the nice work uh, area to work on. It's great for quilting. Okay, when I come into the corner, you might want to do something like this. I'm going to run my pin along the edge of the quilt so I see where that is and just pop in about a quarter of an inch from that edge. See here what I did was I ran the pin in here so I know about where the quarter inch is. I want to stop there. I don't want to go all the way to the end. So at that point I will touch the reverse button just before I get to the pin.
and that will tie off the thread. Then I will touch the thread cutter button and we're now ready to turn that corner. This time I'm going to flip the binding going directly back. See how I have a straight edge here and the binding has flipped straight back. Then take that same piece of binding and flip it back towards yourself and hold that with your fingers and we'll slide it under the machine and continue sewing. For some reason my machine has unthreaded but you know what? That's not a problem because I have an automatic needle threader. So I'll show you how that works. There is a diagram on the machine that tells you exactly how to go. You go through here, follow from one and two, down to three, up to the take up lever, down to four, five, Hook it in the little latch down below. You want to hear it snap in and then follow up along in here and let the thread hang there. And we will let the little robot come down and thread it for us and we're ready to go again. We'll pull the thread through. effortless to thread the machine. Okay, we'll drop our presser foot, get the thread out of our way. It is just amazing to me some of the features that they give us now on our sewing machines. And after I get to the end, uh, before I uh, end the binding, I'll show you why I did it, did it in that way. I'll get closer here. just about to the point where we can connect the two ends. If you have the, the quilt actually resting up on the tabletop, it's much easier. When you approach um, or start getting close. I like to leave probably six, eight inches opening. I think I'll stop probably right in there and we'll lift the presser foot. Okay, now we have come to the point where we have to decide how much of this I want to cut off. So we're going to want to end about, I'm going to trim off some of this here. And I'll show you here why I did that. I trimmed it to about the halfway point between um, where I started and ended. And then I'm going to bring this down like this and I'm going to fold this back where I want the seam to go. That little piece that I cut off is now going to be my measuring stick. This happens to be two inches wide. I'm going to lay that up on top of the piece that I folded back and I'm going to trim it off right there. 
And I'll show you, I'll re-show you what I just did. And that'll be uh, thrown away. So what I have done is I've cut it the exact length that I want. I'll lay that one down flat. I'll bring this binding back up to meet it, meet it, but I'll fold it back. The distance from that fold to the cut edge is two inches. What I have done is I have pinned it the way I want to sew it together. Before I actually sew the seam, I want to show you closely here how I have overlapped this edge an eighth of an inch as well as this one. And I have pinned it at the angle I want to sew and I'm going to test to see that that's exactly how it goes together. And yes, that's the seam that I want to sew. Now I'll sneak the fabric underneath the presser foot, drop it down, and this time I have the needle in the center needle position. Remember it's really easy to move that needle from one um, point to the other just by touching the button. We'll sew off to the other end. And then before I trim it, I think I probably should make sure that I have a match. We'll stretch it out. Yep, we've done that right. So now what I'll do is I'll trim with the scissor to remove that excess fabric. You know, when you do your binding, uh, I mentioned that I cut all of my strips two inches wide. The reason I do that is if you have the strips too wide before you put them onto your quilt, when you turn the quilt to the back side and do the handwork, if this area isn't filled out in here, it doesn't look as nice. So you want to have the uh, binding just the right width so that when you turn it to the back side it's full way out to the edge of the binding. Now let's finish off. I'm going to move the needle position again so I have that scant quarter in. And we'll drop our presser foot. Oops, I gotta move it just a little bit. And we'll complete putting on the binding. Cut the thread. Now we're ready to take our quilt up, sit in front of the TV, and do the rest of it by hand. What I'm going to do is flip it to the back side and hand or do a whip stitch all the way around the outside edge. Or if you would rather, you could do it uh, with a hem stitch on your sewing machine. But I kind of like to do this part by hand. Now don't forget that the pattern that I've shown you how to make today, the pineapple log cabin, can be done in both the large and the miniature size. We have the templates and books for both of them, and they come in sets. I sure hope that you've enjoyed watching the Pineapple Log Cabin going to go together today, and I even hope that I've inspired you to create your own versions of them. Join us next time when I show you more projects with many new tips on Inspired by Char. Inspired by Char is sponsored by Brother. Featured in Char's show is the Quattro, Creativity Times Four. Embroidery, sewing, quilting, and crafting, the Quattro 6000D brings you 100 brilliant, unprecedented, new and improved features. The cabinetry used in this show is by Tracy's Tables, offering a complete line of tables, carts, and shelves custom made to fit your specific needs. Visit them at tracystables.com. Ulfa, there's an Ulfa tool for every job.